In the late 1960s, a growing peace movement suddenly takes a dark turn with the bloody murders of seven innocent people, including actress Sharon Tate. Cult leader Charles Manson stands accused, and prosecutor Vincent Bugliosi faces the dangerous task of putting Manson behind bars. Their incredible story, next on Rivals. McRaney. Prior to 1969, few Americans had heard of an obscure cult leader named Charles Manson or an equally uncelebrated county prosecutor named Vincent Bugliosi. That changed with the barbarous slaying of actress Sharon Tate and six others. Blood seeped into the Hollywood Hills. A country wondered what had happened to the younger generation and the young wondered what had happened to their summer of love. As Vincent Bugliosi unflinchingly stared into the demonic gaze of Charles Manson, what no one knew was that a critical clue to the crime lay locked in the lyrics of a Beatles album. Vincent Bugliosi would discover that, and much, much more. June 15, 1970. The trial of Charles Manson and his co-defendants opened in Los Angeles to worldwide attention. At center stage sat a psychotic killer who changed his appearance from day to day, but never his deep hatred for society. This confusion belongs to you. It's your confusion. I don't have any confusion. I don't have any guilt. I know what I've done, and no man can judge me. I judge me. What have you done, Charlie? No one knew what Charlie Manson might do next. The heavily guarded courtroom was tense, with good reason. And at one point, Manson leaped a table with almost supernatural force, attempting to attack the judge, and later threatened to have prosecutor Vincent Bugliosi killed. Yet in Bugliosi, Manson had met an unexpectedly worthy foe. The ambitious young prosecutor was as driven by the need to dominate the courtroom as Manson was to control his own dark world. In my opening statement, I said that these murders were perhaps the most bizarre, savage, nightmarish murders in the recorded annals of crime. And I think that Linda Kasabian... Like Manson, Bugliosi loved the spotlight. But it was his extraordinary commitment to protect society that set Vincent Bugliosi apart from so many other prosecutors and made him the single greatest enemy of Charles Manson. Though from vastly different backgrounds, the two great rivals do share the same year of birth. 1934, the midst of the Great Depression. Manson is born in Cincinnati, Ohio to a 16-year-old girl who has a strong taste for both alcohol and men. He never knows any father taking his last name from one of his mother's many boyfriends. A drifting petty criminal in and out of jail, she alternately pampers and neglects her young son. When he's 12, she abandons him to the court and he's assigned to the care of Catholic priests. Within a year, Charlie steals a car and commits armed robbery and is sentenced to three years at the Indiana School for Boys. There, older inmates rape and abuse him until he learns how to fight back, turning his fear into violent fury. Charlie Manson's education behind bars has officially begun. 
Vincent Bugliosi grows up in the far more peaceful environment of Hibbing, Minnesota, where his father is a hard-working but successful grocer. The youngest child in a large family, Bugliosi shares Charlie Manson's hunger for attention. But unlike Manson, he's ingrained with a strong sense of middle American morality and has the odd habit of preaching to other children. Growing up uh, in, in a small town in Minnesota in the 30s and 40s, uh, you just naturally knew what was right and wrong. I mean, there were no bad influences, no illicit drugs, no gangs, uh, crimes like uh, burglary, robbery, murder, just almost totally alien to our existence. A top student, Bugliosi, captains his high school tennis team and attends the University of Miami on a partial tennis scholarship. It's there he meets his future wife, Gail. It's a safe, comfortable life, a life Charlie Manson can only dream about. In his three years at the Indiana Reformatory, Manson scales walls and cuts fences, escaping a total of 18 times. At 16, he steals a car and heads for California, hoping to find his mother. Instead, he's caught and this time finds himself doing hard time in federal prison where he will be punished for crimes ranging from petty theft to homosexual rape. Through prison correspondence, Manson would later get to know journalist Paul Krasner. Well, Manson was really a Frankenstein monster created by the American prison system and so he came out, you know, uh, with all of the characteristics that inmates develop. Uh, racism, paranoia, um, uh, ways to do criminal things. He came out. Uh, he was a. He came out as a pimp and a drug dealer. In 1954, Manson gets out on parole. He marries the first girl he sleeps with, a 17-year-old waitress who endures his frequent physical abuse. The next summer, he steals a car and, with his pregnant wife, heads again for California, where he will spend the next decade in and out of prison for stealing, forging checks, and pimping. Vincent Bugliosi, meanwhile, attends UCLA Law School, where he serves as president of his graduating class. In 1964, driven by a growing animus toward hardcore criminals, he takes a job as a Los Angeles County Deputy District Attorney. It's the first step on a road that will lead to his climactic standoff with Charles Manson. Although he celebrates the birth of his first child that same year, Bugliosi remains devoted to his job. An admitted workaholic, he's quickly promoted to trying felony jury cases. Trying a criminal case before a jury, to me that was the that was the ultimate. That was where the drama was, the excitement. More, more was at stake. Sometimes a person's uh, liberty, even their life. While Bugliosi shows his promise in the courtroom, Manson is forging his own future in federal prison. He becomes an avid student of psychology-based spiritual movements. His IQ measures an impressive 121, and like Bugliosi, he exhibits exceptional verbal skills. In prison drama class, he shows a gift for altering his personality to suit his needs. By his own admission, he said, I'm a man of a thousand faces. He was like a chameleon, constantly changing to fit the occasion or the person whom he was talking. Manson spends hours in his cell writing songs and practicing on his guitar. He develops an odd fixation on one rock group in particular, the Beatles. Psychiatrists and fellow convicts alike find Manson paranoid and dangerous, a man who demonstrates a morbid fascination with violent death. In 1966, Manson serves out the final year of a 10-year prison term. That same year, Vincent Bugliosi becomes a father for the second time. But Manson, now twice married and twice divorced, is about to start his own kind of family. 
He'll find his converts among the flower children of the 60s counterculture. And here, Charlie Manson will plant his dark seeds of madness and mass murder. In the turbulent 1960s, millions of young Americans tuned in, turned on, and dropped out in their quest to create a new peace and love generation. The straight-laced Vincent Bugliosi was virtually untouched by this social revolution. But for Charles Manson, it was like discovering gold. On March 21st, 1967, Manson is released from Terminal Island Penitentiary near Los Angeles. At 32, he has spent more than half his life in prison, developing a philosophy and survival strategy he'll soon find useful on the outside. He thought of himself as a master manipulator, and it's what he learned in prison. You know, to protect yourself, you have to be really good at seeing how people reveal themselves. And so Manson, in his own perverted way, was a master psychologist. Charlie heads with his guitar for San Francisco, where he finds a world of young runaways and social outcasts. In many, he sees a spiritual and emotional vacuum just waiting to be filled. With his songs about self-realization, his gift of gab, and the help of psychedelic drugs, Manson quickly finds a following, especially among impressionable young women. Many followers describe his strange, mesmerizing power over them. Sandra Good, who would later spend several years in prison for making death threats against public officials, remains devoted to Manson to this day. He was unlike any person I'd ever met before. He, I hate to use the term, he blew my mind, but he did. He didn't compute. He was nothing that I could assess with words and put into any kind of a category. His music was very different from any music I'd ever heard. It was almost like he was singing what was inside of my mind that I didn't want exposed, and it put me quite a bit on the point. Within a year, Manson is living with more than a dozen young women and several young men, the group's acknowledged patriarch. The Manson family is born, the close-knit family Charlie always wanted. As Manson takes on the trappings of the hippie culture, Vincent Bugliosi remains the button-down lawyer, fixed on success. As a prosecutor, he loses only one felony case. He wins every single murder case he tries. I always aspired to perfection in my professional life. In my non-professional life, I have to say, unfortunately, I'm not that way. But uh, I want to be the best at whatever I do, and I want it to be important. I want to become the top prosecutor in the office, the top trial lawyer. Bugliosi's trademark is thorough preparation with a fanatic attention to detail, a trait not lost on senior prosecutor Aaron Stovitz. I don't want to be a psychologist and say that he was obsessive, but Vince was a very, very meticulous individual in the sense that he wanted to dot every I and cross every T. While Bugliosi climbs the career ladder, Manson brings his new family to Los Angeles, hoping for a career of his own as a songwriter and musician. With his drug connections and harem of pretty girls, Manson quickly makes contacts in the entertainment world, where spiritual gurus are much in vogue. Beach Boys drummer Dennis Wilson helps arrange recording sessions for Charlie and even puts up the Manson family for a time in his palatial home. Manson also meets Beach Boys record producer Terry Melcher, son of actress Doris Day. Charlie attends parties at Melcher's hilltop home, an experience that apparently makes a deep impression on Manson. He wrote some songs uh, that he hoped the Beach Boys would record, and they did record at least one and um, it always, it, you know, one was left to wonder, had he been successful in a recording career, if, if he would have gone down the path he did. 
Manson's chance at a record deal with Melcher abruptly vanishes when the producer learns that Charlie has shot a drug dealer. Melcher breaks off their relationship, leaving Manson feeling bitter and betrayed. It's around this time that Bugliosi successfully prosecutes his first high-profile murder case, winning convictions against an ex-cop and his girlfriend with nothing more than circumstantial evidence. The victory makes him a star prosecutor among the more than 400 in the county DA's office. At last, he begins to experience the kind of recognition he's always craved. He's especially pleased when television takes notice of him. For the series The DA, actor Robert Conrad bases his character on Bugliosi, right down to the prosecutor's trademark vest. Charlie Manson, meanwhile, has become a star in his own special universe. With his growing family, Manson has taken up quarters at the Spawn Movie Ranch operated by an old blind man in the hills northwest of Los Angeles. It's a playground of horse corrals and old movie sets, remote enough for uninhibited drug use, group sex, and hiding weapons. Although a hundred or more visitors come and go, hardcore family members number less than two dozen men and women. They treat Charlie as both father figure and Messiah. Manson directs most of the activities, including games designed to draw out and nurture violent instincts within the group. One of these he calls creepy crawling, sending family members out at night to enter strange houses and move about without getting caught. On the evening of August 9, 1969, he orders four members of the family to put on dark clothes and arm themselves with knives. Manson then sends the four on a mysterious mission, a mission whose aftermath will soon draw Vincent Bugliosi into Charlie Manson's astonishing world. The designated family members are Charles Tex Watson, former football star and student body president. Susan Atkins, once a topless dancer, now the mother of a 10-month-old child. Patricia Krenwinkel, Bible student and Sunday school teacher. And Linda Kasabian, mother of a small child now in the communal care of the family and pregnant with another. They drive to the house where Manson once attended parties thrown by producer Terry Melcher but Melcher no longer lives there. The house in the dark canyons above Beverly Hills is now occupied by a beautiful young actress named Sharon Tate. August 10th, 1969. Newspaper articles and TV newscasts send a shocking story around the world. Actress Sharon Tate, the 26-year-old wife of film director Roman Polanski, is found stabbed to death in an exclusive neighborhood above Los Angeles while Polanski is away on business. Their unborn baby, due in two weeks, dies with her. Three close friends of the couple are also viciously cut down. Jay Sebring, noted Hollywood hairstylist, shot several times. Abigail Folger, heir to the coffee fortune, stabbed 28 times. Her boyfriend, Wojtek Frykowski, stabbed 51 times. A fifth murder victim, teenager Stephen Parent, is found in his car outside the house. After visiting the property's caretaker, he's been shot four times in the head. Blood is everywhere, including the front door, where Sharon Tate's blood has been used to write one word, pig. News of the slaughter grips Los Angeles, sending special fear to the wealthier neighborhoods. Then, less than 24 hours after the Tate murders, another killing frenzy takes place 10 miles away in the Los Feliz Hills. 
Business executive Lino LaBianca is found dead in his luxurious home, along with his wife, Rosemary. This time, the stabbings totaled 67. Police find the word war carved on one of the victim's stomachs. Throughout the house, written in blood, are the words rise, death to pigs, and helter skelter. The La Bianca murders add to the media frenzy, fueling speculation about a gang of murderers rampaging through the city. Charlie Manson, meanwhile, divides his time between the Spahn Ranch and the Barker Ranch, an even more remote spread in California's rugged Death Valley. In early October, officers raid the Barker Ranch and arrest Manson and several family members on arson and car theft charges. Among them is Susan Atkins, who's wanted for yet another murder. That of Gary Hinman a music teacher with ties to the Manson family. But police have stumbled upon far more than just a car theft ring or one murder suspect. Back in Los Angeles, inside the Sybil Brand Institute for Women, the talkative Atkins confides to an older cellmate. With childlike glee, Atkins brags about personally killing Sharon Tate while the actress pleaded for the life of her unborn child. Referring to Manson as Christ, Atkins spins a macabre tale of multiple murders, murders committed by family members under Charlie's direction. Atkins' cellmate reports the story to police. It's the break they've been hoping for. It's also a golden opportunity for Vincent Pugliosi. The young prosecutor is elated when he's assigned to try the case along with Aaron Stovitz. He thought that that was the crime of the century and the prosecution of the century and it would make him the greatest prosecutor. And I told him one time, Vince, there'll be other cases and no one ever remembers their prosecutor. Well, I was wrong. They remembered Mr. Bugliosi. With his customary zeal, Bugliosi takes charge of the field investigation. He works nearly round the clock, gathering evidence against the man he sees as a serious new menace to society, Charles Manson. The typical role of a prosecutor is to present evidence in court gathered by law enforcement agencies. It's not his job to investigate the case. Uh, he's not trained to do that. On the other hand, there's nothing that prohibits him from going out and investigating cases. And I always did that uh, on a major case. After searching for clues at the Spahn Ranch, Bugliosi drives 200 miles to Independence, California, where Manson is still being held on car theft charges. Bugliosi hopes to get a glimpse of Manson himself, the man some claim wields a strange power over life and death. On the streets of the small desert town, Bugliosi meets two of Manson's most loyal women, Lynette Squeaky Fromm and Sandra Good. He's shocked to find an eerie sameness about them, as if their individual personalities have been erased. Bugliosi will later write about all the Manson women. They reminded me less of human beings than Barbie dolls. The more he investigates, the more Bugliosi learns about Manson's unusual powers. Family members often say amen after Charlie speaks, and he's able to silence them simply with a stare. At last, the prosecutor sees his rival in the flesh as Manson is escorted from the Independence Jail. He's about five feet, two inches tall, uh, slightly built, a shade hunchback, uh, long hair, a beard. Uh, he looked somewhat scraggly. Um, in short, he was not very, uh, he was not an imposing figure. But I knew that it would be the biggest mistake that I could make to um, underrate him, underestimate him, because I had already learned of the incredible power that he had to command and get other people to kill for him. 
Back in Los Angeles, in exchange for being spared the death penalty, Susan Atkins testifies before the grand jury. Atkins is indicted on murder charges along with Manson. Also indicted are Watson, who fights extradition from his home state of Texas and will be tried separately. Krenwinkel, Kasabian, and Leslie Van Houten, a former honor student and homecoming queen who helped murder the LaBiancas. The media creates an instant monster, portraying Manson as the worst case example of the hippie movement. To Bugliosi, Manson is a monster, someone so violently angry at society that he must be stopped. Yet in taking on Manson, the young prosecutor faces a formidable challenge, linking Manson to the murders. Although Manson drove to the LaBianca house and helped tie up the victims, he was not present when any one of the murders were carried out. He claims complete innocence. I feel good feelings towards everything. I feel no bad. I know no bad. Okay, gentlemen, to convict right, Manson of murder, Bugliosi must prove conspiracy beyond a reasonable doubt. Gun, as it were. There's no smoking gun in this case. This was a case, a classic case, of circumstantial evidence, placing one piece of evidence upon another until ultimately there was a strong mosaic of guilt. Except for Kasabian, a recent newcomer to the family who did not actually participate in the murders, the women show a complete lack of remorse for the tragedy they've caused. Bugliosi wonders what evil force has turned them into cold-blooded killing machines. One of the most startling things was, uh, was realizing that these people actually thought that Manson was the second coming of Christ. They thought that this man was not only Christ, but also the devil, all wrapped up into one person. And they had many names for him. They called him uh, uh, Jesus. They called him J.C. They called him Satan. They called him the one. And it was at that point that I realized the tremendous grip that he had on their mind. Bugliosi needs no better example than Susan Atkins. As the trial approaches, the prosecution's star witness changes her mind about testifying more willing to face the gas chamber than show disloyalty to Charlie. Bugliosi and Stovitz quickly cut a deal with Linda Kasabian, who hopes to regain custody of her children when the trial is over. In exchange for total immunity from prosecution, she agrees to testify against the defendants, despite the certain risk to her own life. The shadow of several other murders by Manson family members, including the torture killing of Gary Hinman, already hovers over the upcoming trial. Sandra Good has been caught in the courthouse carrying a buck knife, and courtroom security has been tightened. It's in this climate of fear that the trial finally gets underway in the summer of 1970. The moment of destiny for both Charles Manson and Vincent Bugliosi is finally at hand. Bugliosi feverishly prepared for what was sure to be an exhausting trial. He had to show not only motive, but the intangible, mental domination. But Charles Manson had plans of his own. As the trial opens on June 15, 1970, the prosecution team faces four separate attorneys representing Manson, Krenwinkel, Atkins, and Van Houten. But in a sense, Bugliosi is also up against the entire Manson family. As the jury is sworn in, then sequestered, he worries about the element of fear. Uh, a hung jury was certainly a problem. We had to worry about that. Particularly since the jury knew that members of the Manson family were still out on the loose. As someone said uh, very aptly, they said Manson might be behind bars, but his reach extends beyond the jail cell. To get former Manson family members and other witnesses to testify, Bugliosi and Stovitz offer them immunity from prosecution for lesser crimes or convince them they'll be safer with Manson out of circulation. 
Prepared with months of exhaustive research, Bugliosi elicits disturbing testimony about life with Charlie Manson, including his techniques for breaking down individual will. He controlled virtually all aspects of their, of their sexuality uh, when they'd have their sex orgies. Manson was kind of like a maestro, orchestrating what everyone else did. No one else touched anyone else or kissed anyone else or made love loved anyone else unless Manson told him to do so. In Charlie's world, watches and clocks are forbidden. So are birthdays and any talk of the past. There is no time, Charlie tells his disciples, only the now. From certain women, he takes eyeglasses, birth control pills, even their babies for communal parenting. The prettiest women are reportedly used as sexual bait to entice more men to join the group. Charlie supervises the taking of drugs, primarily marijuana and LSD, which enhance the hypnotic effect of his words. At dinner, he often sits alone atop a rock with the others at his feet, playing his guitar and preaching. He delivers a mixed message of spiritual harmony taken from the Bible, the Beatles, and various New Age religions. Uh, one of Manson's favorite words is program. He tells the members of his family, he says, every one of you has been programmed by society, schools, churches, parents. He says, it's my job to unprogram you. Uh, what he did not tell them, of course, was that in the process of unprogramming them, he was reprogramming them to be his slaves and to be his followers. Sandra Good acknowledges Manson's special powers, but denies that he uses them to control others. The fact is, is he did not take anyone's will. He did not break, he did not break will of a horse, of a dog, of a child, of a woman, of a man, of anyone. We all did what we wanted to do, including those murders. In truth, he had an uncanny ability to understand your innermost feelings, uh, your psychological makeup, and he was not at all manipulative because he didn't have any reason to be manipulative. He was happy. He was self-contained. He was what a lot of people wanted to be like. Love for plants and animals and respect for the earth are at the heart of Manson's philosophy. But Charlie also preaches that women are put on earth to serve and reflect men, that blacks are inferior to whites, that Adolf Hitler is to be admired. Overriding everything is Manson's fascination with taking human life. One of his followers would later put it this way, death is Charlie's trip. During the trial, no one can predict how the erratic Manson might attempt to dominate and control the courtroom. From day one, Bugliosi finds himself the target of Manson's famous piercing eyes. He and I used to have a lot of staring sessions. All was initiated by him. He was trying to intimidate me with that Hitlerian stare of his. On one occasion, a lengthy staring session leads to verbal sparring. The intense rivalry between prosecutor and defendant has become personal, and Bugliosi clearly relishes the battle. For 20 minutes, we looked at each other. And his hands started trembling. I said, how come your hands are trembling, Charlie? I said, uh, are you afraid of me or something? He said, no, why should I be afraid of you? He said, I said, well, your hands seem to be trembling. Whenever possible, Bugliosi challenges Manson to take the witness stand in his defense, but Manson only grins. Throughout the trial, Manson and the family make their presence felt in the courthouse or gather on a corner outside, playing to the media. And whatever he would do in court, they would try to emulate him out in the corner. Uh, one day he came into court and he had uh, carved an X on his forehead. He said he was Xing himself out from the world. The next day, all the girls and the young kids in the corner had carved X's on their foreheads. At one point, because of Manson's erratic behavior, the judge takes away his right to act as his own attorney. In response, Manson instigates a series of disruptive tactics. When he turns his chair with his back to the judge, Atkins, Krenwinkel, and Van Houten do the same. 
The next day, Charlie strikes a crucifixion pose once again. The three women follow his lead. When he becomes angry with the judge, his co-defendants turn their backsides to the judge and pull up their skirts. Manson merely enjoys the spectacle, but Bugliosi perceives something else, something he can use. The women are playing right into the prosecution's hands, demonstrating to the jury just how obedient they are to Charlie. On August 3rd, 1970, the president himself, Richard Nixon, becomes a pawn in Manson's game. In a speech to law enforcement officials, Nixon declares Manson guilty. The next day in court, Manson holds the headline up for all 12 jurors to see, nearly causing a mistrial. Not long after, Aaron Stovitz is yanked off the case for violating a gag order by speaking with a reporter about the trial. Vincent Bugliosi now stands at center stage with Charles Manson, two arch rivals in a bizarre courtroom drama that's about to become deadly serious. As the Tate LaBianca murder trial unfolds month by month, the tension between Manson and Bugliosi only rises. The proceedings are as unpredictable as Manson himself, sometimes dragging on and sometimes exploding violently. Uh, one day Manson um, got a hold of a sharp pencil and he leaped over the console table and he started uh, charging the judge towards the bench. And the bailiffs immediately tackled him and dragged him out of court and he shouted something to the judge to the effect, in the name of Christian justice, someone should chop off your head. When Manson tells a bailiff that he plans to have Bugliosi and the judge murdered, the judge begins carrying a 38 revolver beneath his robe. Bugliosi is given a full-time police bodyguard and has his house equipped with a special security system. Prosecution witnesses also receive death threats. One, a teenaged girl, nearly dies after Manson family members feed her a hamburger laced with 10 hits of LSD. But the most shocking event involves defense attorney Ronald Hughes, with whom Manson has been angry. Before the trial is over, Hughes will disappear and die mysteriously in the desert. His death never fully explained. Everyone, including Bugliosi, wonders who might be next. When Linda Kasabian takes the stand to testify as the prosecution star witness, Manson makes a slitting gesture across his throat. But Bugliosi has prepared his witness well, encouraging her to come clean so that she can start a new life with her two children. Kasabian spends 18 grueling days on the witness stand, but faces up to the intimidation implicating Manson in the murders. It's a major turning point in the trial, and dozens of witnesses and experts follow Kasabian's lead. Piece by piece, Bugliosi builds a convincing argument that Manson is the mastermind behind the murders. Now, he must explain the motive behind the ritualistic slaughter of seven strangers, complete with slogans of hate scrawled in human blood. Pigs, according to witnesses, is Charlie's derogatory term for rich white people, not the police, who are more common targets of the phrase. Bugliosi's meticulous research leads jurors back to Manson's favorite Beatles record, The White Album, which includes such songs as Revolution, Piggies, and Helter Skelter. Bugliosi draws out testimony from various witnesses that Manson considers the album to be prophecy. He feels its lyrics speak directly to him about a coming revolution Manson calls Helter Skelter, in which blacks will overthrow whites. In Manson's twisted vision, the black race will be incapable of ruling. Manson himself will then rise up to lead a white master race that will dominate the world. The Tate LaBianca murders, Bugliosi concludes, are Manson's attempt to jumpstart Helter Skelter, to show black revolutionaries how it should be done. 
while triggering fear and retribution in whites. As far-fetched as this scenario sounds, Bugliosi offers the jury convincing testimony and physical evidence to back it up. Uh, I proved to the jury that only Manson had a motive for these murders, and that motive was helter-skelter. And when those two words were found printed in blood at the murder scene, I argued to the jury that that was tantamount to Manson's fingerprints being found at the scene. In late autumn, the prosecution rests its case. The defense also rests without calling a single witness, including Charles Manson. Mr. Manson could have taken a witness stand. He could have denied that he told these girls to go out there and do these things. But he would have been faced with one formidable enemy. And that formidable enemy is the cross-examination of Mr. Bugliosi. By his own count, the obsessive Bugliosi spends several hundred hours preparing his summation. In his final opportunity to stop Manson, he reminds the jury of the unspeakable brutality of the murders and of the ongoing agony inflicted on so many people. Finally, on January 25th, 1971, after deliberating nearly 10 days, the jury returns its verdict. When the jury comes in in a death penalty case, the clerk of the court reads what the verdict is. It's an extremely suspenseful moment. Uh, so suspenseful that sometimes lawyers, if they have a bad heart or whatever, they send a colleague down to take that verdict because it's either life or death. It's a very suspenseful moment. And I looked down at Manson and uh, his hands were trembling again. The court clerk reads the verdict. Manson and his co-defendants are guilty as charged. Vincent Bugliosi as one. Each defendant, including Tex Watson in a later trial, will serve life terms in prison after the death penalty is abolished in California the following year. The district attorney's office and I personally and the Los Angeles Police Department are very, very pleased with the verdict. That goes without saying. We're all very, very happy. The complete proceeding has taken more than nine months at the time, the longest trial in U.S. history. Manson, soon to be convicted of Gary Hinman's murder as well, will attempt to stay in touch with Bugliosi, writing rambling letters from prison that go unanswered. To this day, he maintains his innocence. Sandra Good, for one, stands by him. What Manson wants is his rights in a court of law. He wants the right to defend himself. Uh, he sent me a, a letter not too long ago and he said, um, look, if you ever see Bugliosi, tell him, I said he was in fear of me as pro per, pro per meaning the right, his right to defend himself. He was in fear of me as pro per because I would have put his brain in my pocket. One on one, I would have retired his brain. How does he feel living on our blood? He's all, he says, we are. Good continues to believe that Charlie never sought to dominate anyone. He never wanted to be a leader. Some people just have that. They're born with it. They are natural leaders. He did not want to be a leader. But as I view the whole situation, I see him as heads and shoulders above any world leader of the 20th century. He ha he's, got the ex he's got the experience. He has the mind. He has the, uh, the authority from God to do whatever he wants to do, and his will... To Bugliosi, Sandra Good is living proof of Charlie Manson's danger to society. Going into the trial, uh, I looked upon Manson uh, as an exceedingly dangerous human being with extraordinary powers over other people. So I knew I had to dedicate myself seven days a week, a hundred hours a week, to make sure that he was convicted and permanently removed from society. Uh, there was no doubt in my mind that if he were not convicted, he would have gone out and murdered as many people as he could have. He would have continued to murder. I don't have any guilt. I know what I've done. And no man can judge me. I judge me. Today, Vincent Bugliosi is retired as a prosecutor. 
All five defendants in the Tate LaBianca murder case are also retired, serving life sentences in the California prison system. Nearly a dozen other Manson family members have been convicted of crimes ranging from murder to threatening the life of a president. Of the original group, only Lynette, Squeaky, Fromm, and Sandra Good remain loyal. Yet their undying devotion to Charles Manson serves as a reminder of just how dangerous self-made messiahs can be, whether they be in Waco, Jonestown, or Los Angeles. Charles Manson was but one self-appointed prophet. Sadly, there will probably be others. I'm Gerald McRaney. Thanks for joining us on Rivals.